if you do this on roofing insurance claims and really any type of insurance claims, water damage claims, fire damage claims, if you do this, you will lose. Chad Michael here in Dallas, Texas. Just got back into town from Edmond, Oklahoma. It's just uh, north of Oklahoma City. I was working on a fire damage project out there. And in this episode, I want to discuss something that's very important for all of you insurance restoration contractors out there. Anybody working on a roof claim, hail damage, wind damage, hurricane damage, water damage claims, fire damage claims, any type of insurance claim. And you need to really avoid doing this in order to avoid failing. If you've watched any of my content before, you know that I talk a lot about not discussing policy, insurance policy, and coverage when working on these projects, especially if you're a contractor. And that's mostly for contractors that I'm directing that to. But I also realize there's a lot of public adjusters watching this content, and so that doesn't really apply to you because you have to work on the policy language uh, more than anything. That's what your specialty is. That's why you're brought into it. And so that's not really for you. Um, it's, it's mostly for contractors, but for the contractors, even though I do say that a lot, there is something that you need to be aware of that is related to insurance coverage and policy. You need to be able to verify that your client has the right type of coverage for your project. So first, especially if there's a lot of damages, like the job that I just came from, the fire damage claim, you need to know how much coverage they even have. Like, just because they have coverage doesn't mean that the insurance company is just going to pay up to an unlimited amount to perform all the repairs. So on a fire damage claim, when most of the property is totaled out, most of the, most of the property is damaged, you have to be real careful because in Xactimate, the line items just keep building on top of each other. Meaning, you know, in retail construction, if you're doing something of volume, if you're doing a lot of volume, like on say drywall, like a drywall contractor, they're gonna charge a lot less to come in and do 20,000 square foot of drywall as compared to 2,000, right? or 2,000 square feet of drywall as compared to a couple of sheets of drywall. There, you would expect there to be a price break as there becomes more and more volume on the job. Well, with insurance work, that doesn't happen at all. That's actually one of the beautiful things about insurance work, meaning that no matter how large the job is, if it is 20,000 square feet of drywall, you can expect that there would be no price break for that because the line items just keep continuing to stack up on top of each other, right? So if you're having to include line items for repairs to an entire house, for example, like the place where I just came from, when, when that's created in Xactimate, you can expect that that will probably come down to a much higher price than it would be to build a brand new house in the same place, right? And, and that's why there are maximums on these policies. So you gotta, you have to check that first. The one that I came from, the maximum on the policy was 238,000. And the insurance company right now has an estimate of almost 180,000. And a quick cursory glance of the project would tell you that you know, after looking at the insurance estimate from State Farm, 
you can see that they're short by a lot. Like there's a lot of items that they've missed. There's still the mitigation that hasn't been done yet. So all the, the emergency services, all the demolition, um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into that estimate that's not there yet. There are custom cabinets and they have just regular cabinets. There are upgrades for Ferrari. There are upgraded, North Dallas, what do you expect? There are upgraded um, windows and doors, things that, you know, hardwood flooring, things that are clearly not in that exactimate estimate that the first insurance adjuster uh, created. And so right away I can see that if we do this estimate correctly, it's going to be well above the maximum of the 238 in that policy. And that sucks. So that just means that this thing can only get so great. You know, it can only go so high um, to, to the client's benefit, right? So then you've got to go start looking at some other things that is policy related and coverage related. Now, so for a contractor, realizing that I'm always saying, you know, you can't get involved with policy and coverage, et cetera, et cetera. You have to think of this though, in terms of like a body shop or safe light, they repair windshields, right? Like, so if you have a claim on your automobile, I had one in this vehicle right here, actually recently, you know, if you have an insurance claim on a cracked windshield and you contact a company like safe light, the first thing they're gonna to wanna to know is, are you covered by your insurance? So they're gonna to wanna to verify the coverage. Just like if you go to a dentist or a doctor with medical insurance, the first thing they're gonna to, they're gonna to wanna to do is verify the coverage. It's the same for just about any type of service that you wanna obtain that's insurance related. That vendor or the service provider has to verify that you have the proper insurance coverage. So if it's dental, they're gonna verify that you have the proper coverage for certain types of dental service. And so we, we have to do the same thing from a contractor's perspective. We have to start to open our mind a little bit and learn a little bit deeper about these things in order to ensure that they have the proper coverage when we're doing one of these jobs. And first and foremost, do they have enough coverage and, and you know for the example that I was talking about with the fire damage cover, uh, claim and but then again I'm always talking about ordinance and laws that's the building code upgrade coverage it's the OL coverage do they have enough coverage for that first do they have it and then second if they do have it is there a maximum there usually is what is that maximum right and are there any other exclusions or limitations that could come into play that could affect this project and why do we want to know that i mean if they if they come up short in coverage but it still costs you x number of dollars to perform the service then if the insurance company's not going to pay a portion of that you now have to go to the client and get them to pay for it and that could create a big problem, especially if it's a surprise, because what if they don't have the money? Now we have conflict. What if that's right in the middle of the job, or say fire damage job? So we have to make sure that they have the coverage. We have to make sure that they have ordinance and law coverage. And then a third thing too, we have to make sure that they have the right type of coverage. So we're always really just assuming, I think, that they have replacement cost value coverage, RCV coverage. And I'm not going to go too deep into this. A lot of my other videos cover this, but you know, I, I, I assume that most of you already know the difference between RCV versus ACV. However, after having traveled the whole country and talked to thousands of contractors, I've already figured out that there is actually a great percentage of contractors who don't understand this. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of it, just real quick. Uh, if you already know this, skip ahead a little bit. ACV versus RCV, actual cash value, ACV versus RCV, replacement cost value coverage, okay? ACV is like an auto, most auto policies. However, there are RCV 
policies out there now too. Most of them though are ACV policies, actual cash value policy. That basically means that in a nutshell, if you total out your truck, okay, and the insurance company writes you a check for that, then they're gonna give you the blue book value of that truck, the, you know, what it was worth at the time of the accident. So like they'll deduct, they'll depreciate for mileage, for the condition that it was in, you know, what did it have uh, problems with it already? Was there damage to it already? Was was the radio not working? Was there holes in the seats? You know, they depreciate it from the blue book value and they give you a check for that amount. So that just means that you can't use that money. You can't, you know, you can put it towards it, but it's not gonna be enough money, rather, for you to go out and buy a brand new vehicle, a brand new truck, like the one that you just totaled out. Not, you know, a brand new one at today's rate. So you, they're only gonna give you the depreciated value. Most of you already know what that's like, having already been through that. However, with RCV coverage, replacement cost value coverage, like on a roof claim, you have RCV coverage, then the insurance company has to pay for what it costs to replace that roof today. Like what the value, what the cost, the price tag is to replace that roof, labor and materials and all, today. Not what you know it costs to replace it back when you got it and not, they, they can't depreciate the age of it you know, and the, and the condition of it um, on an RCV claim. Now they do depreciate all of those things. That's where it gets a little confusing. And at the beginning, like usually the first check represents the actual cash value after the depreciation's been deducted. And they pay that to you at the beginning, but then once you replace it, meaning once, once the work has been incurred, okay, the work has been incurred, once you incur that expense of replacing it, then they have to release the depreciation. You know, most insurance companies like State Farm, they actually view that once you've hired a contractor and you can present a contract with your contractor before the work's actually been completed, then they'll usually, they'll pay that, they're usually willing to pay that at the beginning, all of it, the full RCV value. If you have a mortgage on that property, especially if the mortgage company has a significant, uh, you know, risk in the property, if you will, then usually they're going to require that it is RCV coverage, that they, that they do have proper OL or ordinance and law coverage, that it has enough of a limit to reasonably make the repairs if it were to have to come into play, and the maximum value of the coverage is usually enough, you know, a, a significant amount when, when there's a mortgage. That's just kind of a general rule of thumb, okay? And that's why I like to ask, do you have a mortgage on the property? And I, and I like to know that too, to know, you know, will the mortgage company potentially come into play as a payee on the check, right? But I, I need to know all these different factors. I need to know appropriate amounts of coverage. Now, if you want to go a little bit deeper into that, like the fire damage claim that I came from, the guy that had the 238 and the sure and State Farm was already at 180 that I talked about earlier, that deal, you know, I, I knew pretty quickly that it was going to be easy to max it out, okay, but I also wanted to know, is there anything else available beyond the maximum? And the answer to that is yes. So this is where you do, even as a contractor, you do have to start to familiarize yourself with a little bit about um, policy coverage, uh, a limited amount. And you can typically find this information in the declaration page of the policy. So you can ask the client to forward that to you if this does come into play. Um, it's a short, short version of that is the deck page. You might hear that. But the deck page, the declaration page, will actually only give you so much information. So don't just look at the deck page and think, well, you know, that's all there is to know, I'm cool. No, there's a lot more language in the actual policy itself. The one that I'm talking about here, you know, the declaration page is just real short. The policy was actually 40 pages long. 
And so if you read into the policy, you can get more details, um, more exclusions. We found more money in this case because in the policy it states that if it ever is totaled out, like if it ever is maxed out, they are also willing to pay up to 20% above and beyond, okay, for ordinance and law coverage, if that does come into play, like meaning if it is required to be enforced. In this case, definitely was. The house was built years and years and years ago, so there's just no question about that. Uh, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, the whole nine yards, roofing, everything, right? Uh, you know, energy, and on and on and on. Building codes are significant. So there, that tells us right away, okay, well, we've got another 20%, another roughly $46,000, $47,000 available in ordinance and law to take it above that two thirty-eight. And then we found that there's another 5% in additional for debris removal and a couple other little minor things here and there. So that's huge. You know, we found a lot more money just by, you know, being a little bit knowledgeable about policy and coverage. I just don't recommend that as a contractor, you be the one to make these determinations. Like you be the one to be considered as the expert to evaluate these things because that's not the role of a contractor is to be expert with policy. And this is where you know, I don't usually give the public adjusters too much of a shout out. Um, and that's only because guys and gals, I feel like as a, if you're a contractor, you shouldn't have to bring in a PA. You know, because the PA is, is hired by the property owner anyway, so that makes it complicated. But I just think, you know, as a contractor has a lot of leverage themselves. You guys need each other a lot of times, so the PA for sure, you need the contractor. You've got to present that estimate. Um, you have more leverage if you have a contractor involved. I know that because a lot of them have hired me. Um, but here's a shout out to you PAs out there. This is where you really provide a lot of value. If you're savvy, if you're sharp, you know, if you understand your policy, then you're going to come up with a lot of ways that I couldn't above and beyond what I could find, you know, other little loopholes. So that's where it's going to be valuable to network with PAs if you are a contractor, for you guys to stick together. And if you are a property owner watching this, that could be, you know, the, the value where a PA, a good solid PA, and, and attorneys that are knowledgeable about policy and where they would come into play, this could be where it is valuable because they could um, really understand policy language a lot better than most. If you're a contractor, you don't have that. Uh, I've gotten by without needing a PA in almost all circumstances, um, but, I, but I've been around a little longer than most, right? But this is one thing that I would recommend all contractors do at the beginning of any project, like right when you sign a, a client, like how to find out this information beyond just a quick cursory, uh, cursory glance of the deck page and the policy, is to have the client send out an email to the agent at the beginning of the job and copy you, the contractor, to the email. Same thing with the PA too. I think you should do this too. But mostly for contractors, have the PA or the agent, you know, send an email to the agent, copy the contractor. The caveat though is make sure the claim's already been filed. You don't want to you don't want to get the agent involved unless the claim's already been filed because a lot of times the agent's going to try to talk your client out of filing the claim, especially on commercial deals. Well, in residential ones too. I mean, just depending on the age, and a lot of them will try to talk them out of it. Um, and, and a lot of it's misinformation. Like they don't know what they're talking about a lot of the times. Like they'll say, hey, it's just gonna come in under your deductible anyway. That's a ridiculous thing to say without having you know inspected the property, right? But I recommend sending an email to the agent, copy the contractor, and just say, listen, we filed a claim for hail damages, for example. We've hired ABC Construction Company. Uh, attached, you know, copy to the email here is Chad with ABC. And we have some questions that Chad's gonna need to know before they begin the repairs that will be potentially crucial about the policy. And that is, number one, I'm assuming that I have full RCV coverage, or replacement cost value coverage. And number two, I'm assuming that, you know, and first, you know, if not, please explain. 
Uh, number two, I'm assuming that I have ordinance and law coverage, uh, building code upgrade coverage. And if I do, if not, please explain, but if I do, please explain limitations and maximums and any exclusions to that if, if you don't mind. And then also finally, I'm just confirming that I have a maximum of such and such available. And then if you are getting close to that maximum, that's where you might drop a few other questions about um, the additional limits to other things that are in the policy. And you have, of course, other structures and then contents comes into play to all of that. You know, so there, there are a number of questions that I'm sure you can think of yourself to ask the agent right at the very beginning of the project. And when you reply, please also copy Chad to keep us all in the, in the loop. That's a good way of verifying the coverage. Now listen, I just came off of working, I'm still working on it, but on another deal, commercial deal, several million dollars worth. And the insurance company actually commissioned several engineers and the engineers found damage from all types of different causes of loss. And turns out they had, uh, the client had coverage with another insurance company a couple of years ago, just before coming over with this insurance company. So it seems like some of the damage that they have might be covered by that policy. There's a whole bunch of different complicated things that come into play. And the insurance company, you can see them really taking their time with this one, coming up with all kinds of ways to deny this claim, right? They had engineers based on mostly the coverage dates, you know, the, the causes of loss, but they had multiple buildings and the deductible on the whole thing was like $1.5 million, just off the top of my head. And the way that it was worded was that if they filed a claim for any of these buildings, then it was going to be that much of a deductible for any of the buildings. It's really weird, you know? So like, if you had multiple claims for different types of causes of loss, you're gonna have multiple deductibles. And, and then further come to find out that if it's a roofing system that's over 15 years old, then they only owe ACV, the actual cash value. And that's what I was saying earlier on the ARCV versus ACV. You know, if there's not a mortgage and it's ACV coverage, and you don't know that, man, you're not getting them to pay RCV no matter what. And what if they depreciate it by like 50%? And so it just, it really came down to finding out a lot of information like this on this job because the contractor, no disrespect to the contractor, he's one of the best, like one of the sharpest guys. He's a, he's a client of mine, but he was not on the level with his client enough to get all of the information, all the documentation from the past uh, claims that had been called in, you know, other, po like the policy declaration page from both of those policies, all of that was needed, you know, other information, right? And if he would have done that in the very beginning, then he would have found that honestly, this project for him, probably would not be worth pursuing, at least not as an insurance claim, you know? And, and if he would have known that in the beginning, he could have saved himself literally weeks of his time because he ended up going out and meeting with several different insurance adjusters, several engineers. He stressed about it for a very long time. He waited for adjusters to get back with them. He emailed them, he called them, he called board members and corporate people and and on and on and on. You can only imagine. Called me a lot to get my advice. What do you think they're doing? What do you think's happening? And ultimately, when I can see which way the insurance company is going, I insisted, man, you've got to stop what you're doing. Stop everybody. Don't do anything else for these people until you get the information that you need. Once he got it, we found out all this information, and then it was just demoralizing for him. You know, it was devastating. And for me too, it's deflating, you know, to know that you put in all that work, but yet you didn't have even the proper type of coverage. All of that could have been avoided. And that's the topic of the, this episode. And that's the, the, the reason for the title. You know, if you do this, then you will lose. Meaning if you proceed on a job, just assuming that all of these different coverages are in play, 
or if you proceed with working on these jobs without familiarizing yourself with the minor details at least, the basics, the fundamentals of these things, then you will fail. I failed miserably, you know, 15 years ago, approximately, Hurricane, I don't know, either Hurricane Jean, Charlie, Francis, or Ivan, Central Florida. It was, uh, I think it was Deltona, over in the Daytona area, or Deland, that's where it was, Deland. It was a bed and breakfast, and <laughs> they had significant roof damage. It was an old historic building. We went and did all this work, getting all these things approved, you know, and nowhere on the insurance paperwork did it even say anything about there being non-recoverable depreciation. Do you see, recoverable depreciation has the quotes around it, usually. Non-recoverable has the brackets around it, usually. But you have to watch out, it's not always. Don't just assume that if it's not there, then it's all good. But I think in this case, it probably had the brackets, but I just didn't know. And so we proceeded and did miles of roofing and decking and rafters and just all kinds of wall sheathing damage and just then on and on and on, interior damage, only to find out that they only had ACV coverage, which come to find out is very common on historical buildings, especially ones with, that don't have mortgages. So something I probably should have seen coming and had no clue, had no idea, and uh, had no choice at the time but to put it to the client and try to you know, force them to pay. And that certainly didn't work. I had stress coming from subs and everything else, and the subs were going to the, the, the property owner. I was a very young man, but this was a, a, a living, utter nightmare. And I almost lost everything. I almost lost my life, really, if you think about the stress associated with that. And so I like to share that story as often and uh, as much as I can. But I just think that if you do these things, if you check these things off on every claim, you're gonna save yourself a whole bunch of trouble. A lot of people come to me with these types of problems after they've already been working on it for a long time, like many weeks, months sometimes, and they're asking all the wrong questions, like how do we get this hail damage approved? Or how do we um, get this supplement approved? When they never did know all throughout that the coverage isn't even there. I mean, it might they might have potential, you know, some coverage here and there. So, you know, if you know that they have an ACV policy when you sign them, then maybe you could do some creative things, you know, because one of the things about if they have ACV, you're not at all accountable to the insurance company after that. I mean, you know, you could do whatever you want. You don't have to do the repairs that are on the estimate because you don't have to go back and claim them and bill for them uh, like you would for recoverable depreciation. So you can do whatever you want. Just like, you know, that first check that they do get on RCV claims, that, that first ACV check, if they decided not to do the repairs on a roof, for example, they decided to just go on vacation instead or pay credit card debt or whatever, um, that's not actually insurance fraud. They're allowed to do that. So don't be telling your clients that that's insurance fraud. It's really not. It's not smart. That's risky. They could be dropped from their insurance company if they find out about it. If they have a future roofing claim, it might not get covered. It might, it might including tons of interior damages. Um, that could, you know, they could run into problems with their mortgage company. So it's not like it's a smart thing to do. But I just want to let you know, you know, that ACV check, they can do whatever they want with it. You got to watch out for that too. You know, if they bail on you, they can do that. So if they have a contract, that could be another risk that they run into also. But I know a lot of people struggle with clients who pull out. That's why I also say don't proceed with an insurance adjuster or turning over exactimate estimates or doing supplements, things like that, until they have signed. I say that a lot. But when they do sign, make sure that they're covered. I know you sometimes are so excited that they sign and you landed this whale or whatever it is and you can get ahead of yourself, you can get too eager. Happens a lot, people call me a lot like, hey, I wanna hire you to come into the deal. I'm like, okay, do you have the coverage? Like, are they <laughs> are they signed? You know, these are just things that are, in my mind, preliminary, basic fundamentals, 
okay? So you've got to do these things. Just so to recap, ACV versus RCV, you need to know what that is. You need to know what the uh, maximum for, and by the way, uh, coverage A, you know, if you look at these things, coverage A is typically on the paperwork as dwelling, if it's a residential claim. If it is a commercial claim, it will typically say structure, but that is like the house itself or the building itself on a commercial claim. Uh, coverage B is typically other structures or unattached, unattached structures. And these are like uh, the fencing, the carport, freestanding patio, shed, unattached garage, uh, playground could even be one of those things. You know, things like that, that would be unattached or other structures, that's typically coverage B. And then coverage C is usually uh, personal property or contents. That would be like the barbecue grill, the hot tub cover, you know, knickknacks laying around outside and furniture on the inside and curtains and upholstery and uh, shelves and pictures and things like that. That's all personal property. And then, but it's not vehicle. Anything vehicle, it would never be included. That's always has to fall onto an auto uh, policy. Um, and then there's other things, you know, the ordinance of law, there are, uh, it's just other, other, other additional coverages, right? There's ordinance of law, OL, there are lots of other things scattered throughout the policy that is available. And then there are exclusions. Exclusions are a big one, you know, that you want to look at. So, all right, you want to, you want to know, usually on the coverage A, there's going to be a certain amount. Coverage B, there's going to be a certain amount, you know, and then there'll be other amounts for all the other coverages, right? And so you want to know what that coverage A is, what that coverage B is, how those things are going to come into play. Content uh, manipulation, like contents move out, then reset. That might be in the personal property part of things. That might come into play if you need to be creative about things. So uh, the amounts, you want to know the amounts of the coverage, you want to know if they're RCV versus ACV, and you want to know if they have ordinance and law coverage, and if so, what is the extent of that coverage, what are the limitations of that coverage. Thank you so much for watching this content. If you've been watching my channel for a while and you've never com commented before, I would love to hear from you just to see who's who's out there, get to know the people that have been consuming my content. That also includes, you know, if you're just now seeing this for the first time, I've got a whole lot of other videos that I believe will help you win in this game of insurance restoration. So please do check out my other content. Please do check out uh, what's wrong with this insurance estimate series. It's a 10 part series where I kind of take a an ins original insurance estimate where it started and redact out the personal information. And then I show everything about that, go through it and review it, and then show an estimate that I wrote that I thought would, should be an appropriate estimate for that job and submit it to the insurance company and show you all about, you know, how everything about that estimate all the way through it in detail. And then I show you where it ended up, the final revised copy from the insurance company. In some, some of these episodes, it's actually multiple revisions, but I show you how, you know, where it ended up. They usually don't agree to everything. Sometimes they do, but not usually. Um, they usually don't agree to every penny that I have on my estimate, but you can see where they end up. I think that's an excellent learning process to go through that. That'll help you with your estimates, help you understand uh, estimates better when you see insurance adjuster estimates and help you get some great ideas about items to include in your estimate. And then I have another series, it's called How I Write Exactimate Estimates. It's a five part series that is very valuable. It's about four and a half hours of walking through from start to finish on a standard roofing uh, Xactimate estimate that, ha that also has interior repairs and some other um, exterior and other structures like I just talked about. And I think you'll find that very valuable. And there's other playlists on there as well. And then of course, my online training course, IEScertified.com over 40 hours of video and audio training on there, uh, forms, documents, building codes, 27 different Xactimate estimate templates that I wrote. You can have the ESX files and the PDFs and 
uh, everything is in there. Everything relating to inspections, estimates, supplements. People are winning like crazy with that website, which is incredibly humbling and gratifying and satisfying. It's the, the, the thing that I've done, aside from my daughter, my marriage, that I'm most proud of in my life. Uh, but if you need me, hire me, insurancerestorationtraining.com. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so. Chad Michael, the practitioner, hit the bell so you don't miss notifications. My podcast, <laughs> the practitioner podcast, is available on all platforms. And I'm done plugging myself here at the end. That is if you made it all the, all the way to the end. And if you did, God bless you. Much love to all my friends out there. See ya!